You're listening to Now Nostalgia, your weekly look at what's going on in pop culture. I'm with my boy, Dave Martinson, a man who once said, it begins here, and I said, no, it ends here. <laughs> the past is written, Pat. The ink is dry. <laughs> you know who's trying to end us, though, Dave? Universal. Universal Music Group hates us. I, unbelievable, man. So anyone that has been following us, all of our loyal fans on SoundCloud.com slash NostalgiaPod, you may have been like, hey, I missed the podcast last week. I want to go check out what episode they talked 11. about. Yeah. And you're not going to be able to find it. It yeah. is now the lost episode. Yeah, episode 11, which we talked, we had a very good discussion about Drake, new album views, and our opinion of Drake in general. And I really liked that episode. And it was taken down twice in three days. I, I thought that was maybe our best episode ever. We talked about our, our thoughts on the rappers on, on XXL. Yeah. I, I had no idea who any of them were. We yeah, also talked funny. about like a cure for cancer. Pretty sure we exposed the Zapruder film and gave our opinions on who actually killed JFK. There's a lot of stuff on there, but no one's ever going to hear it but us. Yeah. We, yeah. Got, we got a copyright strike for Drake's album art. And the second time we uploaded it, we picked a new image. And we got the same strike anyway, because clearly Universal is automating their search of SoundCloud because they thought we were actually posting this album and not a really detailed and articulate discussion. Kind of got bullied in that regard, but it is what it is. So tweet at us, at NostalgiaPod, if you want to hear our thoughts on Double XL Freshman List or Drake. Yeah, it's actually really funny because this is almost exactly what Bernie 2016 stands for. Fight the big man. Take down the establishment. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Dave, yeah. I think you want to start with something a little in- interesting today. So Yeah, yeah. You- Real quick. So Pokemon Sun and Moon had a trailer drop today. Release date comes out in November. Let me briefly mention that in one of our fir- very first episodes. But I just wanted to call out the new starter Pokemon, the Fire Guy. You know, he's always, mm. always a Fire Guy. You know, Charmander, of course, classic. Yeah. This year, it's a Fire Cat. Oh, no. Do you know what the... No, no. Do you know what the name is? I have no idea. Litten. Stop! It's like a kitten, but it's oh lit. Oh my god. <laughs> Can't make this up, dude. <laughs> well, it's actually kind of funny that Pokemon is, <laughs> is like trying to stay relevant in pop culture by using the phrase, it's lit, lit. in one of their new Pokemon. It's actually kind of clever. I think it's hilarious. But... Uh, so wait, what is do, does it a uh, does it evolve into like... We don't, we don't know the evolutions yet. Mm, interesting. That'll be... But, I hope they keep it I just, clever. I, 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 I didn't see it at first, and then I, I looked at the names, and I I I think my math might actually drop. It's just too great. I know so, when That's you, funny. I know when you run into the Pokemon that it usually says a wild whatever appeared, but I hope it says it's lit and appeared. <laughs> Something like that. That would be so much yeah, better. Yeah, we'll find out in November. So, Dave, we talked about Laura Croft, I think it was three or four weeks ago on yeah. the pod, mm-hmm. and we talked about how we thought Ray, a.k.a. Daisy, uh, Ridley. Daisy Ridley, should play her or should play her, or it'd be an interesting movie. Mm-hmm. If you want to hear more of our thoughts on that, go listen to the podcast. But we didn't man- mention in the queen no he did not she got cast in this alicia vikander man huge oversight i, I know <laughs> our very first episode for the oscars we talked about our love for her in uh, ex machina mm-hmm. and she ended up winning uh, the oscar for the danish girl and in general she's been on a great winning streak with burnt and ex machina danish girl man from uncle mm-hmm. she's gonna be in jason bourne coming out this summer now she's Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. I think that's fantastic casting. I don't know how I missed that. I, she's pretty much the perfect, at least, yeah. image of her. I think she'll kill it in the role as well. Yeah. I mean, she's pretty much fantastic in everything she does. She's also in that Tulip Fever movie. I think right. she's playing opposite Christoph Waltz in that. That's her, yeah, it's her only other like movie on, upcoming at the moment besides this. That'll be interesting. She also, the other day, started her own production company. Really? Do you know what the name of that is? It's Litten. Vicarious Productions. Huh. That's an awesome name. Interesting. Very clever. I wish it was It's Litten. That would have been amazing. But That's Vicarious cool. Productions. Also, if you didn't see her dancing in the, at the Met Gala, that was awesome. Mm, stunning. I know I sent that to you on Instagram. Yeah, so no. I, as soon, double I saw, tap I, that. I was leaving work, and I, I was on Twitter. On the, on the Hollywood Reporter, I literally caught the tweet of Vicander being cast as soon as it came out, just because I was scrolling. And I immediately texted you. I was like, wow, this is amazing. 
I'm so down. Yeah. Then you text me back, I'm pissed we didn't think of this yeah. first. <laughs> I was, I literally couldn't believe we, that was such a big oversight on our part, but great casting. Yeah. Very excited for this movie. Very excited for the Han Solo movie coming out in 2000 yeah. and, was it 18? 18 is correct, yeah. So, and I think we know he's going to be playing that, don't we? We do. Alden Ehrenreich, he was in the final three on that short list. We and talked about a few weeks ago, soundcloud.com slash nostalgiapod. I think he was our second choice. Yeah, we were more on the Taron Egerton mm-hmm. train. And the more I thought about this once Aaron Reich was cast and I listened to other people chime in on it, I think I, I realized that I was really just rooting for Taron Egerton because I, I had thought of Taron Egerton as a uh, cast session before that final shortlist came out. So I was like, oh, I thought of this. Yeah, mm-hmm. go me. Right. I want him to get picked. But Aaron Reich clearly this, was the superior actor of the bunch. Well, I think I think Taron would have been a great choice because he plays a very similar role in Kingsman. Exactly, that's what I was thinking of. So he just seems like a natural fit for it. And I mean, I also like him as an actor. Yeah. He's someone I root for. Mm-hmm. I had never actually seen anything Alden Ehrenreich is Same. in. Same. But I watched a couple of the scenes that he was in in Hail Caesar, and he plays this uh, dopey like Western uh, actor yeah. trying to be in a serious role. And he was actually great. I saw a uh, scene with him and Ray Fiennes that Goat. was really interesting, funny. He might have... Uh, th- this might be a much better casting than uh, than Taron Ed- Edgerton. And I think so, yeah. I mean, he has gotten the, got the attention of good actors uh, a long time ago. And he's since worked with Francis Ford Coppola twice, mm-hmm. uh, his daughter Sophia Coppola, the Coen brothers and Hale yeah, Caesar, and also Woody Allen for Blue Jasmine. And I've also heard really good things about his movie, his role in the movie Beautiful Creatures, which came out in 2013. So I'm going to try and uh, do my homework on him, but obviously 2018 is a ways away. But we got some time. he has officially been cast. Yeah, we got some time. But I, I think that I don't think there's much more to say on that until we hear more about oh, it. And anything else? But there's a lot to say about Game of Thrones. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't talk about it last week. If you did listen, you would know that. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we'll just say right here, spoilers for Game of Thrones through three episodes in, all the episodes, so spoilers, here's your warning, mm-hmm. come back in ten minutes for other stuff. Right. But Game of Thrones spoilers, so. Where do you want to start with this? There's a lot to well, we didn't. We didn't know, we haven't talked about uh, the return of uh, Lord Snow. Uh, we knew that was going to happen. Yeah, You're still course. in the pod, and you yeah. said you would quit if he didn't come back. Yeah, so. I did. You're I did. here. Yeah. Everybody, everybody. Two weeks ago, we did, or three weeks ago, we did our Game of Thrones preview, mm-hmm. and we, we, we explained why Jon Snow's return was incredibly important to the narrative. And if you missed out on that, that's a very good discussion as well. We talked about just our thoughts for the season in general, but here we are. Three episodes in. So Jon Snow is back. I thought that was a great scene. <laughs> yeah. We, although the, the, the second that wolf... Is, or, Ghost. Uh, go, sorry, when uh, the dire wolf, his head goes up, I thought maybe he was get, his body was going to be in the wolf, and I was like, oh, no. Work. Like, that would be... Right. A really Pop- popular weird book choice. theory for for a while, yeah. And then Jon Snow pops up yeah. and he kills his uh, betrayers. Yeah, Sir Alistair dead, and Ollie with Ollie. that cold that, stare. Ollie, what a scumbag! Ollie's huh? cold. Everyone, I know. Like, Jon was just trying to look out for him. Yeah, he hung him too. Interesting, as opposed yeah. to uh, chopping off the heads. And then but his, his watch has ended. I know that I'm actually really interested to see where he decides to go now. I think he might go to Winterfell. I don't know. Yeah, that's that, that, that's a popular theory, you know. I guess in the books, and I don't think this happened in the show, but Ramsay basically sends him a taunting letter and says, right. "You know, I have your sister. Come get me." And basically saying that's so, that's the only context we know in the books of Stannis dying. We don't right. that battle that we saw at the end that isn't actually like described on the screen. We just have that letter. Yeah, John was planning to march on Ramsey, so I'm interested to see if him and assumingly Tormund and his wildling friends. Right, that's probably the uh, the faction that will go. He left uh, good old Ed in charge of the wall, so he'll probably leaving the wall soon. <laughs> I know. I'm sure Davos and Melisandre will uh, come too. Ed may be having the fastest rise to power ever. Yeah. He, he was like a non-factor basically until the beginning of this right. season, and now all of a sudden he's that's great. He's the head of the watch. No, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with John. But actually, I found a lot more about this episode interesting than what's going on with John Snow. Same. Um, so where do you want to start? I, I kind of want to start with Arya. Sure. So she win the week, as a uh, Chris and Andy said. Chris and Andy said that, that that she won the week. 
I guess if you get your sight back, you probably should, but I don't know if I would say she won the week. I don't week. think she won the week. Uh, and I think we'll she had a cool to... montage. That's funny, I guess. And uh, actually, I thought that that I just was... kind of knew this was coming. Like, I know she's getting her eyes back mm-hmm. uh, because it happened in the books, but... Uh... I guess I'm not reading it. I wasn't <laughs> sure that she was going to. I right. was suspecting she would. I thought that they handled the training really well. Because sure. they didn't take too long with it. No, three episodes is definitely enough. And then they had that montage where you see her getting stronger and better. No one now. Yeah, and, and allegedly. And I, I think that seeing where she's gonna go next, and hopefully if John uh, can maybe meet up with her eventually, and we'll see. Yeah. Have some kind of brother sister vibe or maybe it's a cousin cousin vibe who mm-hmm. knows mm-hmm. that would be great yeah and um, she'll just have some training of some kind happening soon I, you know I'm, yeah i'm not super looking forward to her story because i think they're still it's still gonna plot along for a little longer so we'll see as well as denarius's story denarius yeah. just be plotting but something has to happen with that soon. Just chilling with the dash colleen the, those Bastille dragons Thrak. need to come and get her like uh, now, the preview, uh, the final scenes. I think Jora and Dario f- are founder, so mm-hmm. they'll either approach her, or try and bust her out. I don't know. We'll see. But okay. I, I, I said a few weeks ago that I don't really care what happens with Daenerys. I'm just not interested in what happens. With her. I'm interested in what happens with Daenerys just because she holds the power of the dragons. Yeah, and yeah. Well, she doesn't have any of them with her, so but she's what? pretty essential to making sure that they help in the final fight. So. We'll see. Anyway, so who do you think won the week? Mm, I think Bran won the week. <laughs> Bran, Bran is actually maybe the most interesting part because not only did he show us probably the best scene of the season so far, essential flashback, but you're also starting to see maybe Bran's powers are even more powerful than we realized. Mm, yeah, um, uh, the Three Eyed Raven was a little uh, surprised, surprised, uh, apprehensive, taken aback when uh, Bran was like, "Father." Right. So mm-hmm. Bran has a flashback that shows his dad, Eddard Stark, and uh, seven of his friends. His okay. companions, yeah. Hal and Reed, who is uh, mm-hmm. Mira's dad. Right. Mira's the, uh, with, the girl with Bran, with Bran. Up, in, up in the north. north. They're at the Tower of Joy. Yeah. Uh, this happens right at the end of Robert's Rebellion, so, mm-hmm. which is, that's the conflict that makes Robert become king. And, and Rhaegon dies. Yeah, so Ray, Robert already killed Rhaegar on the Trident, which is basically what ends the war. Jaime stabs the Mad King in the back. Mm-hmm. We already kind of know of that. At the rate of the Tower of the Joy, Joy, we saw the fight. Kingsguard guys are there at this tower, which is in Dorne somewhere. Mm-hmm. And they weren't protecting their king. They also were the best friends of uh, Rhaegar. Uh, Sir Arthur Dane, who was mm-hmm. the guy who was dual-wielding dual those swords like a boss. Yeah. <laughs> he was like Rhaegar's best friend. He, he won the week for me, because even yeah. though he ends up getting stabbed in the neck from, in the back and dying, yeah. he that, that scene of him dueling Fantastic. those two swords, amazing. Right. Uh, I mean, while they he had five people fighting in a circle around him, and they mm. were apprehensive to make a move towards him. Yeah. That's how, how good and dangerous he was. So yeah. he, I think he won the week for me. Yeah. Ned has like a dream of sorts about the uh, event, and mm-hmm. then it was always said that Hal and Reed saved Ned's life, and everyone always talked really highly of Sir Arthur Dane, like the greatest knight ever, greatest swordsman. Barrison said he's mm-hmm. better than him, Jamie's better man. than Jamie, so it was really cool to see him on screen for the first time, but obviously we didn't really see what's in the tower just yet. Sure, so... We uh, can certainly speculate. So after Holland Reed stabs uh, Arthur Dane in the back, mm-hmm. Eddard Stark is heading towards the tower because he hears something scream, yeah. and Bran, being so excited to see his father, and also being taken aback by realizing that his father lied to him about how the battle actually went down, mm-hmm. Eddard had, or Ned had told him that. Honorable Ned. Never. Yeah, that he had killed Arthur Dane, but that's not how it actually went down. Remember, his honor got him killed in season one. Yeah. But he lied about this important thing to basically everyone. So the question is, why? It'll, it'll come. It will come. But what do you think it means that... Do you think he actually heard Bran yell at him? <laughs> I don't know. That's tough. Bran's powers. I really don't know how to where to draw the line with quantifying them, you know? Right. Warging and green seeing, and now he's like green. He's kind of green seeing now because like when he like looks through the trees and and he can it, also it, jump into bodies, which yeah. I don't even have a word for that. It's a power yeah. that no uh, one's skin really changing. Had. The fact that the three red raven reacted mm-hmm. in a confused, not a confused, but negative way. Bran definitely had some kind of influence. Absolutely, it's like he, Ned definitely heard him, but he just heard him. He didn't see him or anything. So. 
Yeah, I what think that means, I have no idea. Right now, Bran is such a important character because he's showing these flashbacks, but it's also yeah. interesting to see how he's going to play a role moving forward because yep. I think Sean talked about it on our podcast. We're thinking maybe he's just going to be giving us a view. Like I think that right. was Sean's theory. Just to yeah, the I don't. I don't. Out, I, I think he will leave the tree. He's got to play a bigger like, role. Like the Raven said, that's he's not becoming like him. He's not going to stick in this tree forever. So right. there's something else for Bran, but I, it's really tough to pinpoint what that will be. Absolutely. Did you give a fuck about what the hell's going on with Sam? Sam? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that's another uh, thing that's like already having the books right now. He's just like, in, he's in transit. Like, mm-hmm. he's going to Old Town. So, no, I don't give a shit. Like, we, 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 I know it's coming. Like, right. he's going to drop Gilly off at uh, his, at the Tarly, the Tarly, uh, mm-hmm. the right. Horn Hill. And his dad hates him, Randall Tarly. Mm-hmm. So, that'll be interesting. But, yeah, I kind of want to see Sam get to Old Town already get that Ma- Ma- maester uh training underway so let's get on with it i think this that, was... that should be the only scene like i think the next scene it's them arriving so yeah. we, we need that scene you know it's actually interesting because i think this was the only episode where i kind of felt like okay did we i don't know if we needed to see this much or to this extent like i feel like they could have cut down the sam scene the whole part with Tyrion talking about which was a funny part but talking with uh... i think having lighthearted like, moments is good though absolutely well they, they the had, show is so brutal they, and they were violent in front of john's dick size so that was yeah that was awesome <laughs> um and that's funny because Tormund in the books brags about how big his dick is ah. so that's that's in character what else stuck out to you about this episode what else you want to talk about rickon Oh yeah, crap! I forgot. Uh, Rickon, someone I had no idea how they were bringing him back. It's in, in the hands of Ramsay. Yeah, in the books, it's like briefly hinted that we think we know he's on this island off the mm-hmm. coast of in the north, and Davos is going to go get him to help these other northern lords that are plotting against the Boltons. In the show, the Umbers apparently yeah. are uh, joining with the <clears throat> Boltons, which I did not see coming, unless it's a ruse. The Umbers who would not kneel to Ramsay, but, yeah. oh, I'm going to give you a gift, a dire wolf's head and a yeah. Rickon Stark. If you remember, if you've watched, like, if you binge the show, like, relatively recently, you might remember that uh, the small John, Umber, his father, the great John, uh, the former lord of the house, because apparently he's passed, Greywin, Rob Stark's dire wolf, bit off the great John's fingers. Oh. In, like, a scene when they were, like, arguing in, like, the battle tent. Great John, like, Got great respect for Rob after that, so that, you can like YouTube that little clip. And you'll that, that's the that'll give you a little more context on that house. Ramsay may have lost his first star, which is very important, obviously pulling the north, mm-hmm. but now he got another one back, who's also a male, Rickon. So very yeah, interesting. And, and Rickon would be the other than Bran, the last one to have any shot at actually uniting the Seven Kingdoms, right? You, uniting the North. Uniting the North. I'm well, sorry. yeah, because. Uh, John doesn't really have a claim as a bastard. Right. Stannis offered to legitimize him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stannis, we assume, is long dead now. But we assume. John might try and get that underway, unless mm-hmm. something we don't know about John comes up in later episodes. I don't know. We'll see. It's uh, I like the season is very plot driven thus far, really making moves. And I guess your your quip about Sam, yeah, not as many moves being made with that kind of stuff. Exactly. So, this, I, I, I think, like, a, like I was trying to say before, this, at, like you said, the season is so driven by so many different parts of the story. However, I feel like this episode they did kind of throw in some things that maybe yeah. didn't need to be in there as much, but just kind of to give it a little break, especially because a lot of this is getting pretty heavy. I mean, mm-hmm. we saw a baby get eaten by dogs last week. I mean, yeah. I guess we didn't actually see them tear right. it apart. But, we knew what happened. So there's uh, some brutal stuff. We saw a kid get hanged this week. So yeah, he sucked. Yeah, so it was a, a, a good dick joke every once in a while. Yeah, Make, drink, drinking games. Yeah, and... exactly. Even though <laughs> Tyrion's gonna be the only one drinking. Honestly, Miss Sandy, like I, Grey Worm, obviously, like no sense of humor with him. Right. But like Miss Sandy, come on. Like, yeah, I know. Come on. Now. Real stick in the mud, that Miss Sandy. Lame. <laughs> Anything else you want to talk about, Lannisters? I've always really liked what's going on with King's Landing. You see Kevin mm-hmm. run as the hand of the king right now. Elaine Terrell's back. That's great. Right. The mountain. Uh, was, that was really funny when yeah. Pycelle was talking about how they should kill the mountain when the mountain's right there. Mm-hmm. And also, they were just re- referring to him as Sir Gregor. They're like, yep, this is the mountain. We're not even like, lying yeah. about it anymore. You guys all know. You get yep. it. Uh, <laughs> cool to see Kyburn taking control of uh, Varys' spy network, the little yeah. birds. Until the very end of the books, we didn't actually know that they were just little kids. You never really knew how he knew everything. With the but, whispers. But yeah, he had his network of kids that like ran in tunnels and, and stole letters and actually red letters and remembered shit mm-hmm. so it's cool to see how that's going so Cersei obviously trying to uh, 
get you going down. It's cool to see her and Jamie uh, united together again. Do you think we're going towards a trial by combat with the mountain and well, yeah, someone uh, else? Cersei's just, yeah. Tommen is not yet done. Tommen was bitching about it to mm-hmm. the High Sparrow. Who, <laughs> yeah. Man, do I hate the High Sparrow. That He's guy is worst. a pompous mother. <laughs> but the mountain will be her champion. We know that because of the Kingsguard. Uh, nice, nice move for right. Kyber and taking care of that. Mm-hmm. But who will be the champion of the Faith? Theory, the Hound. Yeah, that's, that's we'll gonna be quite Ian the showdown. Ian McShane's character should be coming on the show soon. He's only in one episode, so I'm hyped. That's gonna be quite the showdown, and I think that we're we'll, we're definitely gonna be talking about Game of Thrones as uh, the season goes on. Right. Oh, so where's Littlefinger? Oh, he the, he's always in the shadows. Yeah. Actually, always in the shadows. The preview, I, I I usually don't watch preview, but it was on when I was leaving the room. I think we're gonna see him in the veil with sickly little Robin Aaron. It's going to be interesting. cannot give less of a F about. <laughs> <laughs> but Littlefinger is yeah. always behind the scenes pulling the strings. Making those moves. So Game of Thrones. Make sure you're staying up to date on this show. Yeah. And avoiding social media until you've seen the episode. Because a show this popular that has this much social interaction on, online, mm-hmm. like, it's in your best interest to be up to date. But obviously you always can't watch it, you know, that night. But you cannot be on Twitter at that time if no. you're not up to date. Like you, you should know this. It's season you really, six. You really can't be on Twitter till the afternoon the following day because that because that's usually the, uh, when the tweets will stop up in the right. recaps and things the, like yeah, that. like AV Club Vulture. Everyone will exactly. send out their articles about why that meant something. And right, it's in your best interest to catch up. And if you are interested in Game of Thrones but you haven't watched it yet, uh, what are you waiting for? Yeah. It's, it's the most high priority show on your list. It's an awesome show, and we saw an awesome movie. This weekend, we did. We, t- we uh, most of the world did. We have talked about <laughs> it a lot on this pod. We did, a- including last week, which you probably missed. <laughs> yeah, most likely. But I think there was about like twenty to twenty-five listens. So for you lucky lo- people that the heard loyal it, twenty, yes. So Captain America: Civil War it came out. out, and boy, did it make Batman vs Superman look like shit, in my mm. opinion. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll, we'll harper back to DC. Uh, connections later, but let's look at the money. Its opening weekend in America was 179 million, so it didn't actually beat Ultron. It's very strong, fifth biggest debut of all time. And as of recording today, it's passed 700 million worldwide, which is crazy. Very good. The, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has now grossed over nine billion worldwide. Mm-hmm. Once all the movies, and also a really big record. Uh, Disney passed one billion dollars this year. This year's box office receipts domestically in America. Only 128 days, which oh. shattered Universal's record of 165 from last year, which they set on the heels of Jurassic World. That's nuts. So, that's a really big uh, deal. Also, Civil War did very good in China, which hmm. by as soon as next year will probably be the biggest film market in the world. It will overtake the United States. So, Six, just something to keep an eye on. 60 Minutes actually did a really interesting piece on that like three weeks ago. Side note. Anyways, uh, it was directed by Anthony and Joe Russo. Yep, Russo Brothers. It, it's holding strong at 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. It is, yeah. Which is pretty impressive for a superhero movie. Yep. Uh, Avengers and Winter Soldier are about that high, too. Mar- when Marvel hits it right, they really do. And I, th- this is a movie I'm a really big fan of. They've been knocking it out of the park, I think, with the last couple. Especially the, all of the Captain America and the Avenger films have all been pretty yeah, good, I, mean, I would say. Uh, People are a little down on Age of Ultron from last year, but it's not so much that it's bad, it's just that it's uh, it was just kind of more of the same, mm-hmm. no needle pushing, which is the other ones. But uh, yeah, Ant- people are pretty pretty high on Ant-Man, obviously Guardians of the Galaxy, huge surprise hit. So Marvel's doing very well, Doctor Strange will come out later this fall, we'll see how that does. But yeah, Civil War. How did you like it, Pat? Uh, I thought it was a, a good movie. I think I talked talk last week about how I have a little bit of superhero movie fatigue. I'm feeling, I think, more excited for Suicide Squad because I was looking for something different. But this movie gave me something different. Yeah. I was... So, I mean, the fight scenes, I thought there were some... Oh, full spoilers, really... by the way, for Civil yes. War. So Sorry. turn this off if you don't yeah. want to know what happens in the movie that everybody in America has seen. Yeah. But Book, um, Bookmark and come back. I, I thought some of the fight scenes, especially the one at the beginning, um, the airport, and the one at the end, were all mm-hmm. incredible. I don't want to say they're better than the ones in the past, but for some reason they looked different, and especially the yeah. one in the airport stood out specifically. I think also just the meaning of the one at the end 
watching oh, yeah. watching you didn't want, want to watch that fight no it was a brutal fight no and it, it was and we'll, we'll, i think we'll talk more about the ending sure. as we go i also liked the pacing of this movie even mm-hmm. though it did feel a little bit long and i think that's just more of the fact that i was hungover after my birthday if it, you want to give pat a uh, old late, late birthday present you give us a review, review on it <laughs> Please. Nostalgia. Give us five iTunes. stars. It, it really did slow down in parts, it, yeah. just to lay out some backstory. It did, and I think the the amazing, it is amazing, airport fight scene, that's in the end of Act 2. Mm-hmm. In Act 3, which we'll get to the ending, uh, inevitably had to slow down a little bit. But even the beginning fight scene, when uh, when they, they see Crossbones very briefly, right. uh, which kind of start kicks off you know the conflict, mm-hmm. uh, I thought that fight was really good, too. I uh, really did some cool stuff for Falcon, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's kind of my, my big takeaway from this whole movie is that every hero, every character in this movie had good moments. Everyone had a little chance to shine, like even if it, whether it was comic relief mm-hmm. or some great back and forth, some funny banter. A lot of awesome scenes where people, characters were meeting each other for the first time, funny yeah. introductions, stuff like that. It really started off with Falcon, uh, whether it was his like his new technology like whether he's like using his like wings as like bulletproof shield or red wing his little like drone, drone thing yep uh, and also falcon i think it was just really funny he was doing really well in the beginning i liked him a lot yeah i mean he's basically captain america's sidekick yeah he, he pretty much just does anything captain america well, he, tells him to well because falcon uh, <laughs> sam wilson he's cap's uh new best friend and right. bucky is his old, old best, best friend. friend and i think they they buck, had awesome rapport buck, yeah they, they did really well whether it was that funny moment in the car yeah or, or after spider-man when, takes yeah down, exactly you couldn't have done that sooner yeah <laughs> <laughs> so no there was definitely some some great rapport there i also liked a lot of the new additions uh, I want to get. I want to start with um, Chadwick Boseman. Oh yeah, sure. So I think we talked about how excited we were to see Black Panther. Yeah, and I really thought he added a lot to the movie. Yeah, I liked it a lot. He apparently improvised his accent. Which really was interesting. Yeah. So we actually knew Black Panther was on the way in Age of Ultron because if you remember the middle of Age of Ultron, Ultron deals with Andy Serkis playing actually a human character called Ulysses Claw, which is a Black Panther villain. Right. Like an arms dealer that uh, Tony Stark used to deal with when he sold mm-hmm. weapons. And that was how Ultron got all the vibranium from his body, which is the material that Cap Shield is made of, a material from Black Panther's Wakanda, a fictional African country. Mm-hmm. So we kind of already had little seeds being you know planted there, but now we finally got him. I thought he was great. The action was cool. Uh, people initially made fun of his costume when it was first revealed, but I think Black Panther, the physicality was was very present. And Bozeman, when he was uh, just being T'Challa, just uh, you know not in the suit, uh, right. really charismatic. It was really cool. It was it was like a nice little soft origin story leading up to the Soul movie coming out in 2018. Yeah, and it fit in well. To the, I, it didn't it didn't feel like they you know pushed it into mm-hmm. an already packed movie i really don't think so at all i, I think that I, I think that's the thing that sticks out to me most about and i know i started off by i think trashing, everything worked right and I, I know i started off by trashing batman versus superman but i feel like everything in this movie especially how the plot moved along mm-hmm. um and having zemo kind of behind the scenes pulling the all these strings in this yeah. direction really made a ton of sense Whereas I feel like things about Batman versus Superman, and especially the motivations of some of the characters, yeah. really felt confusing right. and not so clear. But every motivation in this felt like it made sense. And you could see both sides. Yeah. That's the other thing. Oh, 100%. And especially Baron Zemo. Not a super strong villain. We know that's always been MCU's you know, uh, weak uh, flaw, mm-hmm. but I think Baron Zemo is one of the best villains just because he was super nuanced. He wasn't just this, you know, megalomaniac, stereotypical supervillain with his grand plan to destroy everyone, but he was just kind of motivations were made very clear, especially by the end. And yeah, his plan may have been a little convenient. I've mm-hmm. seen that prison thrown around, but a lot of things are convenient in movies so they can act function as a movie. So I feel like that's kind of a a, a dumb criticism, right? I I guess I can understand that. You know the criticism that okay, so they're already having this conflict, and this guy is just moving it, for the, moving them further apart. Yeah, but at the same time, and remember that they established this growing Ultron. separation in Ultron. In you know, that, the scene uh, where Captain America pulls the log apart, which was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> but yeah, once again, a lesson to DC about character moments are way more earned when you establish them over time. In Marvel's instance, over multiple movies, mm-hmm. we saw that here again. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Daniel Bruhl, I think, did a good job as Zemo. 
Yeah, and I think coming back to Zemo and kind of how, sure, it seemed convenient, but you have to consider that the thing that was tearing them apart already was something he was affected by. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like he's just some guy who all of a sudden is trying to pull them apart and he has no connection to what was already pulling them apart to begin with. I also really liked how this... I, I think one of the things Marvel does really well that DC hasn't because they haven't had right. time to do it, is right. that they've humanized a lot of these characters. Oh, yeah. And it's a lot of fun to see them all together and to see the camaraderie and yeah. that feeling of we're the Avengers, it's the togetherness mm-hmm. at this point. And they've kind of gotten over that dark broodingness of, yeah. um, you know, oh, it's a curse and a blessing to have these powers. Mm-hmm. They're kind of just, like, accepting it. And yeah. But you really saw that human side of Tony Stark and of Steve Rogers right. in this. Right, and that's, a, uh, that's great, too, because we've, we've already really dived into uh, the human aspect of Tony. Mm-hmm. I know I, P, P, Iron Man 3 is very polarizing, but showing Tony at PTSD, I think, was was a great uh, thing to do. Right. Uh, not, not making light of PTSD, of course. No. This did feel like a Captain America movie. I know it's very much yeah. Avengers 3, but it was a Captain America movie, mm-hmm. and you could really... Cap is like the heart and soul of uh, the MCU. But, I mean, I think it was really cool seeing Vision and Scarlet Witch have some moments, too, because... That's a thing. That's a romance from the comics, if you didn't know. But also, Vision was at the end of Ultron. Really didn't know much was going on there. And Scarlet Witch, same thing. So I think uh, fleshing those characters out at least a little bit for the future, I thought was great. Hawkeye, when he showed back up to uh, like you know pseudo rescue mm-hmm. Scarlet Witch, I thought that was done really well. And then his interaction with Black Widow, mm-hmm. I thought was cool too. And I think just to kind of stay on the idea of like human of. Mm-hmm. The idea of humanizing the characters is that vision you're starting to see become a little bit more human, yeah, whether which is right. really interesting. It actually ended up probably in the biggest tragedy, which I thought Don Cheadle's character War Machine was going to die. Yeah, uh, I, I honestly like this really brought War Machine like back into my mind. I kind of mm-hmm. you know kind of forgot what Rhodey had been doing the past few movies because he you know was kind of behind the scenes and not right. really in them that much. The fact that he didn't die, I actually really like now because a we we saw him seemingly dying in the trailer so we right. thought we saw it coming so the fact that he didn't die i think is huge but the uh the screenwriters for the movie in an interview explained why they didn't kill anyone and they said that people set aside their differences with death everyone comes together at a funeral and that's a good point because we don't want civil war to end with everyone totally back together and cool no. and yes we tony got a, a burner phone from cap so they're not like mortal enemies nor that they ever would be Right. But the ideological differences are still there. We have two separate teams of Avengers right now. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the, the writers in that interview ex- justify not killing anyone. I think it makes sense for the movie. I think that does make sense. And you saw that both Captain America and Iron Man lose somebody in, mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, Bucky is goes back into cryogenic freezing at the end yeah. um, in an extra scene. and uh, In Wakanda. Yeah, and obviously, um, like we talked, touched on, War, Mas- War Machine now is has lost the Paralyzed. ability to walk. Mm-hmm. Although I'm sure Tony Stark's going to figure out something to help that. I, I think that's interesting though, because that's a good way. To, why did we say they should kill War Machine? Because he was kind of extraneous character. We don't need him in in, mm-hmm. in the movies. I think this is a good way to do it. You can, this can be a very easy way to keep him on the sidelines. Same thing with freezing Bucky. Some people aren't big fans of Bucky. I think Bucky worked very well in this movie. But having him go into freezing so that he can't take advantage of his past indo- indoctrination, mm-hmm. that's a good way to keep him off the table until you want to use him again. And also, there's another Marvel character you can use in the Black Panther movie if you so wish. Yeah, absolutely. Which is interesting, too, because that's being directed by Ryan Coogler, who did Creed. Uh, so I think that's going to be cool. Sylvester Stallone forgot to thank when right, he won the Golden Globe. Right, now I want to talk about the introduction of Spider-Man. Oh, of course, yeah, so good. <laughs> Tom Holland, yeah, nineteen wait. years old. Let me uh, let's we'll, we'll just come out ahead of this. So, we were making fun of Tom Holland a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, being a young Spider Man when we when we saw that tra- his uh, debut in the second trailer. But also, it wasn't like that at all in the movie. Tom Holland was fantastic. He was. He's already the best portrayal of Spider Man. I can a hundred percent say that confidently. <laughs> Well, he's also the one who's most realistic to a teenager. Yeah, he's a 19-year-old actor, looks much younger, mm-hmm. and he plays like a, a kid. And as Peter Parker, his 
immediate chemistry with Tony Stark was excellent. And that was a great decision by Marvel to put him with Tony Stark. Yeah, it didn't feel shoehorned. Exactly. Yes, can you take Spider-Man out of this movie and the movie's just the same? 100%. But the way they brought him in with Tony, I think, worked great. It makes total sense, and it also makes him so much more interesting to start. Yeah. So I thought that that was a great choice. I also liked the energy he had. I mean, when yeah. he's first talking with Stoney, it's very bashful. Stoney? But then, yeah, with... Uh, Stoney Tark. Yeah, Stoney Tark. That's what it was. Or was it uh, M- Mr. Stank? Was that what? Mr. Uh, Stank. Yeah, I think that's what it was. <laughs> Anyways, uh, when he was talking with Tony at first, he's very subdued, very kind of bashful and yeah, then yeah. <laughs> as, as he comes out and especially once you see him put the suit on that anxious ADHD type energy that mm-hmm. Spider-Man has in almost every comic comes yeah. right out and, and like I said back to like those great interactions all the times when uh, Spider-Man was talking to you the first time when he was fighting mm-hmm. Bucky and Falcon I don't know if you've ever been in a fight before but people don't talk this right. much <laughs> kind of reminds me of uh, when Paul Rudd shows up as Ant-Man and he's like oh, yes. oh uh, nice to meet you Mr. Captain <laughs> yeah. uh, there's so many great moments like that but yeah Spider-Man's fighting in the airport was, I think was awesome yeah and, and especially when he had to take down big Ant-Man yeah, Giant Man. Did not see that coming. Mm-hmm. I, I, I knew that that was a thing. Hank Pym, the first Ant-Man. Michael Douglas, the Ant-Man movie. Has a few different uh, identities. One of which is Giant Man, which gets very big. And it's exactly what we saw. That was insane. And then when Tom Holland makes a Star Wars reference, because Disney owns Star Wars, you can do that in, in mm-hmm. these movies now. <laughs> and, they, and he referred to that really old movie, and they made fun of how young uh, uh, Peter Parker is right. in the story. Like Everything worked. And... In that whole scene, it was great. Yeah, that that scene, uh, people were, were uh, really hyping that up before it was widely released, yeah. and for good good reason. Because that's probably the greatest superhero fight scene. I think so. I, 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 and just seeing them all do so, such different but important things, very cool things too, right. was definitely uh, awesome. What did you think of the ending? Yeah, so did not really see Bucky killing Howard Stark coming. Now, I... I the one afterwards, I realized that that was more hinted in Winter Soldier, mm-hmm. but I didn't remember that. Also, when I was watching the movie, they had that flashback scene with uh, Howard Stark and uh, Tony, young Tony, right? Well, like, bumming at home. I, yeah, it's uh, in the uh, like the augmented the, reality thing. Yeah, the goggles. I, I forgot about that as I was watching okay. the movie because I saw all this great action. Yeah, I liked that. I thought that was a really interesting way to get it together. Some people were like, oh, it's super convenient. Okay, yeah, but. Everything's convenient in these movies. Just yeah. let it go. It's uh, it's nitpicky. You go to a superhero movie to have fun. I mean, it's, this has fun as well as you possibly can. I think, it, but also having real stakes. Exactly, and and having characters that you care about. I mean, watching Captain America. There aren't logic like gaps of logic in this. No, movie there's like not. That. Watching Captain America and Iron Man battle in that last scene, especially yeah. when Bucky was kind of sidelined for and a second. And he rips Bucky's was, arm off. Yeah. Oh, and and they, it, they got that money shot where Iron Man's like pushing his energy blast against the shield, which is a direct mirror of like the comic book cover from the Civil oh, War comic awesome. back, in, back in 2006. So I thought that was really cool. But yeah, that fight was brutal because cause Iron Man was showing up to help Cap because mm-hmm. he finally realized that it really wasn't Bucky. It was Zemo's been pulling these strings. They were going to go... And then Zemo was like, nope, um, I was hoping you'd come so I can uh, drop this on you. Also, it makes total sense that Tony Stark, who's dealing with all of this like overwhelming, crushing guilt, all this unresolved grief that he even mentions in the beginning. Right. And, Which and we knew has been building. Right. And, and then he finds out that Bucky kills him. And not only that, but Captain America kept that information yeah. from him. It makes total sense that he would kind of snap to this next right. level. And it's like, even though he knew Bucky wasn't himself... That's now why he snapped. It's because Cap kept it from him. Exactly. And also watching Captain America on top of Iron Man and then bringing the shield down. And not, yeah. For that split second, you're like, oh, shit. Is Captain yeah. America really about to go there? But then he just destroys the, the suit. I actually had a split second where I was like, are they about to kill off Iron Man? Like the arc react? The, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the thing in his chest? Yeah. Yeah. That would have been pretty crazy. But then also at the end, seeing that they, they're... On the same side, they're not necessarily friends. This is a, something that's probably always going to be in the middle of them. They're not going to mm-hmm. resolve. But that they're, it sets it up nicely for Infinity War, I thought. Right. There's no real MacGuffin in this movie. The, I guess the closest thing to it is the, the yeah. Sokovia Accords. Yeah. Bringing back Thunderbolt Ross from The Incredible Hulk. Mm-hmm. But the, the characters are very much in different places. Because as far as we can tell, Cap, Hawkeye, Ant-Man, Falcon... 
they're outlaws. They're on the run, like secret Avengers from the comics of sorts. But uh, by by staying on the same side is that they philosophically yeah. understand that they're they're together. They said the operate. They're, they're united. They may not be together together like right. they're not all avengers at this point mm-hmm. because obviously they're outlaws but i think once thanos shows up that's going to be a really easy way to say okay we can right kind of forgive some of these transgressions we need everybody to yeah stop. i'm interested to see if they're not together till the end of the first infinity war mm. you know also are we going to see cap until infinity war we know we're seeing tony uh, iron man in spider-man homecoming next year right are we going to see some of these guys in the black panther movie I don't. I doubt we see any of them in Guardians too, so, or in, I doubt we see anyone in Doctor Strange. That's a straight origin. So, mm-hmm. be interesting to see how we get to Infinity or Everyone, you know, we can always. Yeah, everyone has the grand outline in their head. We've known that. But. Isn't there a rumor of a possibly an Iron Man four? Yeah, Tony. Uh, Tony Robert Downey Jr. has talked it up, talked it down, probably six times in the past year and a half. RDJ, figure it out. Interesting where they would put it on the slate. If you look at the Marvel slate, starting in next year, they have three movies. Mm-hmm. Because this year we have Doctor Strange in the fall. The next year we have okay. Guardians, Spider Man, and Thor Ragnarok. Oh, and no, Thor Ragnarok's no. important because we'll get Thor and Hulk again. And Black Panther's the. And then twenty eighteen okay. is Black Panther, First Infinity War, Ant Man and the Wasp. Mm-hmm. They, they pushed they pushed the schedule back initially once they got the Spider Man film. Mm-hmm. Like, they can make that. And Captain Marvel's another interesting one because I think that'll be more connected to. Guardians first. That's Carol Danvers. That was the role that Ronda Rousey was campaigning for back in the day. And then 2019, we'll have the Avengers Infinity War 2 and Inhumans, if that happens. That's TBA at the moment. TBA. And we'll also get Captain Marvel in 2019 before Infinity War in Part 2. So interesting to see if they push Captain Marvel back, how much they really have her planned into the end of Infinity War. If I was to guess, maybe the Guardians show up with Captain Marvel by the final Infinity War movie. Mm -hmm. It's uh, interesting, though. Well, I I think that that is a good place to wrap up for today. I do want to give a a warning, a trigger warning to MaddieTX05. You will not like this podcast because we do not trash uh, Captain America Civil War. So don't give us another one-star rating. Just don't listen to it, MaddieT. Hit up all those critics at all the respected film reviewing outlets for not giving it a negative review either. Yeah, exactly. But if you enjoy the podcast, please review us on iTunes. Search us and uh, give us a five-star review. Leave a comment about how we're doing and any suggestions. You can find Dave where? You can find me on Twitter at Martin Swagger, M-A-R-T-N-S-W-A-G-R. And like Pat said, follow the show on Twitter, SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, iTunes Review. Really big help. At Nostalgia Pod on Twitter. Yep. And you can follow me at Sheen World Peace on Twitter, S-H-E-E-N-Y-W-R-L-D-P-E-A-C-E. Shout out Matter World Peace, and we'll see you next week.